the average uh, experience of a soldier in the British Army was seven and a half years. The average uh, experience for a field grade officer was 20 years. The British Army had been put together over a 150 year period of time. It takes a long time to create an army. You can't do it de novo. I mean, where do you put the commissary? Where do you put the quartermaster? Where do you put the latrines? What are the promotion rates? What are the relationship between artillery and infantry? Um, uh, there is also a British aristocracy that goes into the army. Both the Howe brothers, who were the commanders of the army and the navy in the invasion of New York, both went to Eton. Um, both were aristocrats. One was a member of the House of Lords, the other is a member of the House of Commons. So there's a tradition uh, of members of the British elite becoming officers in the, mil in the army or the navy. And what makes the, the, the British army by itself was probably as good as the French army, but no better, and not quite as good as the Prussian army. Really? Yeah. But you put the British army and the navy together, and they're numero uno because of the prowess of the British navy. Um, and in the war, one of the things that I noticed is the British always, well, the British never win when they're inland. When they're inland, like Saratoga, they get surrounded. So they have to fight either on rivers or on the coastline. Um, but the American army is comprised of people whose average experience is six months. Some of Washington's eventually most talented officers, people he's handpicked, are having to learn on the job. Nathaniel Green becomes his most trusted lieutenant. Uh, he's a general Quaker from Providence, Rhode Island. Never fired a shot in anger, never had any experience. One day he's a private, the next year, day he's a general. <laughs> um, Henry Knox, former bookseller in Cambridge, read about war, 300 pounds, uh, looks like Santa Claus. He becomes a great artillery officer. But New York is like, like a, a, a hands-on experiment for them. Um, and the militia, which are, there's a kind of balloon theory in the American strategic thinking, like we'll have this core of regulars, and then in any given battle, all the local militia will show up. But like, if you think about it, what are they supposed to do? I mean, they don't have the same weapons, they don't have the same, you know, you can't, there's no interchangeable weaponry. Um, uh, most of them are worthless in conventional battles, and they all run away. <laughs> so the myth of the militia is a myth. I yeah. mean, you know, it's self a myth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, there are a couple occasions where that doesn't happen. Saratoga is one of them, but um, Lexington and Concord is an earlier one. But um, I think that the American army is no match for the British army and navy in any conventional battle. Um, and that is one of the things they discover in Long Island and Manhattan. There is a problem, too, that the Americans have that is Washington's major problem at this stage. I mean, his major problem, he's got this inferior force, which he projects as, a, as himself, and he, he, in other words, he's, always, he's totally invested in this. He harbors an honor-driven sense of battle. If the enemy appears, I am honor-bound to meet him. It's like a summons to duel. You, a gentleman cannot reject that. So if William Howe presents his army on Long Island, I must meet him square on. This is a suicidal strate strategic idea. And he should have been thinking, the last thing I want to do is defend New York. New York is an archipelago. Whoever controls the sea controls the battle. You're outnumbered 42,000 to 28,000. You're outgunned because they can move artillery on the ships around. The thing to have done was take him in, in, inland to New Jersey or Connecticut, avoid the battle. He didn't think he had the, the, the right to do that because the Continental Congress had told him to defend New York. And civilian 
uh, 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 superiority over military, something he really believed in. But one of the consequences of the defeat in Long Island and Manhattan in the late summer of 76 is that Washington's thought process starts to change. He begins to understand that this honor-driven sense of battle is not a good idea and that he needs to avoid conflict uh, whenever, it's, whenever he doesn't have a tactical superiority and an exit strategy. Because, and this is a profound, though obvious in retrospect, insight, the Americans don't have to win the war. The British have to win. And eventually, if you string it out, and they string it out for seven and a half years, they're going to simply say, it's not worth it anymore, and leave. It's our country. And that's what happens. Um, and Washington begins to fight what they call a war of posts. It's not quite a, quite a guerrilla war because he's got a conventional army, but he's avoiding conflict whenever possible and unless he has superiority. He makes a couple of mistakes in Ger Germantown, he does. But um, anyway, the reason we win the war is because Washington decides we don't try to win it. We try not to lose it. Um, and if you think about it in history, Many of the great generals are losers. Hannibal's a loser. Um, Napoleon's a loser. Robert E. Lee's a loser. Rommel's a loser. Washington lost almost every big battle, but he won the war. And it's the lessons he learns in this first couple months of the war that, that makes that possible, I think. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.